will see my screen now. Yes. I, I can see it. I yes. Can. Okay. Okay, um, my name is Gloria Namanya and I'm a researcher at the Macquarie AI and Data Science Lab at Macquarie University. Uh, this talk is going to be about geospatial data visualization and distance measure. So I'll get right into it. Uh, so what is geospatial data visualization? So it is a constructive practice that integrates interactive visualization into traditional maps. Basically, it allows you to it allows you to explore different layers of the map. It allows you to zoom in and out of the map. It allows you to change the visual appearance of the map and relate a variety of factors to the geographic area, just like we're going to see. Um, then the geospatial technologies. So there are very many geospatial technologies that you can use for visualization. Uh, geospatial technology enables you to acquire data that is referenced to the earth and use it for analysis, simulations, and visualization. So some of the examples are the geographic information system. So for it, it's a framework that provides you the ability to gather, manage, uh, and then analyze spatial and geodata. So some of the examples, like you can see, ArcGIS, QGIS, there's Google Earth Pro, and very many others. So it's a computer-based tool that you can use. And then another, another example of a geospatial technology is remote sensing. So for remote sensing, uh, you detect and monitor the physical characteristics of an area without, uh, without, uh, without making physical contact with the object. So for it, you typically use sensors and it's mainly used by researchers to collect information about Earth. They use remote sensing for that. And then the next one is the global positioning system. This is the GPS. So for it, the goal is for uh, the device to locate itself from anywhere on earth at any given time. So what happens is that each satellite uh, broadcasts uh, a signal about its location as well as current time. So with the work that I'm going to present, uh, it's mainly going to be using this GPS. So I'm going to be showing you how we've been using this to visualize data, geographical data. So on this next slide, we look at the importances of geospatial data visualization. It provides you the ability to visualize location-related information easily. That's self-explanatory. It makes it easy to convey information to the audience that they can easily understand. I'm sure if, um, if someone gave you numbers of from this region, we are getting uh, 4,000 4, and something, something. And then from this region, 3,000. From this region, 2,000. You, it's, it's easier to understand if I showed you a map. For example, a chloropath map maybe that shows how the different regions are performing. So you understand better when you see than if you read. And if you read or if you're just told about the numbers, then it helps organizations anticipate and prepare for possible changes due to changing special conditions or location-based events. Then it aids in proper decision-making through improved insights that foster decisions. So this is for both, still on the project that I'm going to be talking about, for both agriculture experts and then for the team at the lab. So for the agriculture experts, it helps you monitor, it helps them monitor crops disease, then maybe to know which regions are being affected, which regions have um, more disease, crop disease infections so that they can provide clean planting material, which regions should they su supply pesticides to, et cetera. And then for the team at the lab, it's important for incentive, incentivizing, I'll explain that later. And then also for research purposes, for example, if we find out that Kamuli region is producing a particular crop of interest that we want to do our research in, then maybe we can provide more incentives to that, to that region and the farmers in that region so that we can get the data that we want for our research, which is email and other things. And then another example, and another importance is it helps us to identify, explore and exploit significant patterns of data collection. So based on different things for the different groups, then another one is it helps us see or track farmer movement in their regions and also to calculate the distance traveled, which I'll also be talking about. So the next part, 
So there are very many ways and techniques to visualize geospatial data. So I'm going to only be talking about these because of what's coming next. This is what I've been using, and I'm going to be showing you how, how I've been using it. So we start with chloropath maps. So for chloropath maps, um, uh, chloropath maps you use, use they're used to represent statistical data through various shading or color patterns on predetermined geographical areas. So what happens with chloropath maps is that it, the higher the numbers, the darker the color that you're using for visualization. And then for heat maps, um, they're also called density maps. Data it's a data visualization technique that shows magnitude of an occurrence, such as color in different dimensions. So it's also the same thing. It's with the color patterns, I'll show you that. Then we have the cluster maps. For the cluster maps, they determines how many data points are located in a specific region and they're good for density measure. So for cluster maps, um, you'll see different data points where data is coming from. You'll see different data points where data is coming from and then you it sort of rounds up different regions within the same point. But when you keep zo zooming, when you keep zooming in, you get a better you get better representation of what's coming from what particular region. I'll explain, I'll show that cluster map. So geospatial visualizations, I hope I'm still being heard. So geospatial visualizations work best when they address a question specific to spatial analysis. So location and position should be central to the investigation. There is no way you can do geospatial visualization without spatial data or something related, having a specific geo point of a place. And then, <clears throat> so um, these are some of the examples. So for example, you can answer questions such as which areas of a country get the most train? What airport sees the most traffic? Uh, why does a bird migrate over the course of the year? And then what is the fastest way to get from point A to B during rush hour? So you can investigate these questions by overlaying data on a map. So you can, you should only use your spatial visualization when the data lends itself to spatial analysis and you can display it clearly. So you must be, it must be able to bring out what you're looking for. Yes, then the next slide. So um, these are some of the research questions based on the RCROPS project data collection. So I'm going to give a brief about our RCROPS project that we've been working on at the Makere AI lab. So um, the aim of the project was to use radio and image data for crop disease surveillance in Uganda. So this is crowdsourced data from the farmers in different districts across the country. So um, the farmers, <laughs> Uh, these farmers that are, were on the project were carefully selected with the help of our stakeholders, the agricultural experts from Namulonge, the National Crops Resource Research Institute in Nakri, based on certain criteria. So they, uh, they identified these farmers and then these farmers were able to help us with the crowdsourcing of the data that we received to use for the project. So some of the criteria is the crop production based on the uh, crops of interest, which for our case, it was beans, maize, and cassava. And then the prevalence of the crop disease of interest. So this is very important to ask the lab and also the agriculture experts for research purposes. So one may ask, um, why? why did we what? Why did we use crowdsourcing? So for crowdsourcing, it is, it, it is a very effective way to collect ground truth data. So the experts do not actually have to make continuous trips to different districts for crop disease surveillance. So it makes it easy for everyone, for the experts as the researchers, you get ground truth data and it's very easy and it's cheap also. That's why we, that's why we use crowdsourcing. And then, um, so during the training, uh, the farmers were briefed on how to collect the data using the AdServe tool. So the AdServe tool is a data collection tool used by the farmers on a mobile phone. It's a tool that was developed by the technical team head, headed by Mr. Solomon Sumba at the lab, Makari AI lab. Um, 
the training included the agronomy and the, and the technical aspect of these two of the two. So for the agronomy, they were taught on the different uh, uh, that the experts talked about the crop production, uh, the diseases affected on the different crops and other things. And then uh, the data that we're able to collect from that, from using the ads have two includes the status of the crop. So if it was healthy or if it was diseased and if diseased, there were specific diseases that were picked by the experts. And then also we got the image of the crop. So a farmer is able to take a picture of the diseased leaf using the mobile phone. And then also the location. So that's where I come in, the geospatial work. Uh, so for the location, it's the data collected is geocoded. Therefore, it has the longitude and latitude of the point, of the specific point of data collection. So that is basically it about the a brief summary of the ARCOPS project. So this is now the research questions coming out from that. Which districts in Uganda produce the most crops? Which districts are submitting the most data for those specified crops? Which regions are producing the most crop disease? Um, which regions are producing the most beans, maize, or cassava submission? So basically the patterns of crop submission by district, region, and by crop over time, plus the status of these crops healthy and diseased. So this is very rich data and you can get so much information from it if you do analysis. So I'm going to be talking about some of the things I do. So you, uh, from this data, you can look at which regions were producing the most diseased crops. And if the disease, diseased, which disease is there that is in that region, which disease is dominant in that region. Yeah, and then, um, yes, yeah, so I think we we'll, shall see some of that later. So these are some of the research questions that we were answering. And then, so I'm going to talk about since most of the presentations none covered geospatial, I think I'll just cover two slides to give a brief introduction of how, how I did this. So first of all, you would load your data set with location info, that is the latitude and longitude normally using pandas. Then you can download, install and import GeoPandas. So GeoPandas is a powerful package for loading, analyzing and visualizing geospatial data. So it is, if you're using Python, you would to do, if you're using Python to do geospatial visualization, it's a very, very powerful package that you can use. So what we are seeing here, the very first cell that has geometry. So the geodata frame needs a shapely object. Um, so we use GeoPandas points from X, Y to transform the latitude and longitude into a list of shapely point objects and set it as geometry. So that's what's happening here. So our GeoPandas, our geodata frame, which is this, the GDF equals, it needs, it needs that geometry. So that's what happens there. And then the next step, which you're seeing Uganda equals gp.read file. So for the next step, we get, we get the geodata set that contains a spatial layout of Uganda by lo latitude and longitude. So this is the ship file, it's a shape file. What it does is that it stores uh, the data as primitive geometric shapes. So those are the points, the lines and the, and the polygons. So they help create a representation of geographic data for example, now these lines, points, and polygons will help form cities, districts, regions, countries. Yeah, so when you get, so the shape file, you get it specific to the area or region or country that you are working on. So for our case, it's Uganda. So we load the shape file. That's what's happening down there. Then the next, now you convert your pandas data frame. The my pandas data frame from the start is the fin, F-I-N. You convert that pandas data frame into a geodata frame. That's what's happening here. So we use the geometry from this to convert it into a geodata frame. So the CRS is very important because it tells Python how those coordinates relate on specific places on Earth. That's why it comes in there. And then <clears throat> the next one is uh, the next part down is doing a spatial join. So the spatial join is you're adding up what's you're adding up content from your ship file and then you're merging your ship file with your data. 
with your geo data frame, the new geo data frame that we've created here. So it happens at the point of intersection. And for our case, the geometry column appears both in the Uganda file and the new geo data frame. So that's the point of intersection. You cannot do a spatial join without a point of intersection. It has to be there. And then if you have like missing coordinates, it will bring up errors. So you have to make sure there are no missing coordinates, missing points for the latitude and longitude. Everything has to be there. So when 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 you run it and you get errors, you can always check if you have null values in your what in your data set. Yeah. So that's a brief about the geospatial work. So then you come up with something like this. So you have the you have the original data set. I mean the original data frame, the one that the information that we get from the farmers, then you match with the special gene. So this helps you with the different visualizations. So we can see that there's a farmer X who sent in information in 2019, September, that the crop was diseased. And then he was in Wakiso and <clears throat> coming from the central region. Yeah, then the next. So the next part is going to show the visualizations. So starting with this. So this is our, our crops data. So it's a basic visualization of the different points where these farmers were sending data from. So you can see from this, you can clearly see where the data is coming from and the different areas that are concentrated where this data is coming from. But um, the thing with such a map is that it's not interactive because even as there are very many dotted lines, I can't zoom in to see exactly the point where the farmer is coming from, but it's a good representation. You can still see where the data is coming from. And then you can also add your, you can also add and name the, the different districts in the country, which is what I did for the next, why isn't it working? Yeah, which is what I did for the next slide. So this was radio data. It was just sampled. It's not a complete, it's just a sample of what was done. So the red um, represents the, the data that was sent in by the farmers and the blue represents the, the radio stations in the country. So when you see such a map, that it has an issue of, or it's up to you, it depends on how you want to label it. You can decide not to, to represent the, the, the regions that are not submitting any data or places that have nothing particularly going on. So you can avoid such things like the crowding in this corner, or you can still, after, sorry. So after your merge, you can still pick out a specific region and be like, I'm going to concentrate on the central region and see how the central region was performing. So this is what I did on the next, next line, on the next slide. So here I was just looking at central, data for, for both where the radios are and where the, the, the farmers are collecting data from. Also, this is not a full representation because there are more radio stations within the central region, but as you can still see, most of them are concentrated in Kampala district. Yeah, so now the chloropath map. Like I said about the chloropath map, so for chloropath, it helps you show regions of high intensity where um, submissions were coming from. Though the issue with chloropath maps is, as you can see, Kayunga is, the, it, it sort of highlights the entire district. It's a good um, method of visualization, but it highlights the district, but it does not tell you the specific points where this data is coming from. So if it highlights it like this, you can think the whole of Kayunga contributed. Yet, if you look at another map, you'll notice that only maybe the central, I mean, the southern part of Kayunga was contributing because I mean, the upper side, there is Lake Sugar, there is, so it doesn't bring out um, other features that are involved in the, in the map. It just gives you a representation of which district is producing the most and something like that. And then, so another thing that we, another interesting thing that we looked at was the submissions of the farmers before the lockdown and then during the lockdown. So from this map, you can see, I was trying to compare how are, how are these farmers doing? So chloropath are also good for that. They help you compare like different activities and what was going on. So you can clearly see that the central region performed much better during the lockdown. You can easily just see it up. 
visual, through the visualization. So you can see that moving, they didn't collect any data during the lockdown, yet before the lockdown. So before the lockdown is the central pre-lockdown submissions, and then during the lockdown is the central lockdown submissions. You can clearly see that Mubende here was collecting data, but during the lockdown, no one from Mubende, no farmer from Mubende submitted data. And then you can also see that Kalungu and PG regions changed their minds and they collected some data during the lockdown. So before Kalungu and PG, they were not sending anything before the lockdown. And then during the lockdown, the farmers, I don't know if because they were home and they decided to send us some data. So you can also see a significant decrease in data collection in Wakiso and Nakasongola. So I did this for the different regions to show how the, <clears throat> sorry, to show how the different, how the different um, regions were performing before we were locked down and during the lockdown. Then you can also see clearly that the Eastern region, people, people um, that there was an increase, there was an, a slight increase in what? In submissions in the Eastern region. So you can see that Kalachi, Namutumba, Bulambuli and Iganga, they collected data, data before the lockdown. And then when it came to the lockdown, they didn't submit anything. So they didn't participate in data collection during that period of time. So these are some of the interesting things you can look at. Uh, then there is Ngora, the contribution decreased, and then you can see Soroti collected more data during the lockdown than before. So before the lockdown, Soroti was submitting, but during the lockdown, I think since people were home, they decided to participate more. So uh, chloropath maps can also help you in that. I also did the same for the <clears throat> I did the same for the for the northern region. So this northern region. Um, you can clearly see when you just look at the map that Ajumani and Pakwat have a brighter, a brighter, higher color representation than the rest, even if it's true that they still didn't perform better during the, during the lockdown. So with Claropath maps, it will just show the higher representation regardless of whether, um, regardless of whether the, the, they perform better before or they performed less before. So you could think that Ajumani performed better during the lockdown, yet they performed better before the lockdown. When you look at our legend, Raki, you can see that it, it can it could give you a it could mislead you, the, you you to think that they perform better. So I'm going to show you this using the 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 heat map. So you can see with the heat map that even if this is saying that so the map only represents what's happening in that particular context. So for the lockdown, it is true that Ajumani was performing well compared to the rest of the part, but it is not true that they were performing better before during the, I don't know if that makes sense, but the heat map is supposed to bring that out. So you can see that they actually performed better before the lockdown and during the lockdown, they were, <clears throat> losing my voice. During the lockdown, they were, <clears throat> sorry, during the lockdown, there were lesser submissions. Then you can also see Mobende. We talked of Mobende performing um, during before the lockdown. And then when it came to the lockdown, no one sent anything. So that's very evident using our heat maps. And then another region is, uh, let's see, uh, there's another region here in Napak. I think that is Nab Nabitaluk. Um, uh, yeah, that is Nabita look. So they buff, before the lockdown, they sent some data, but during the lockdown, they didn't send some data. So you can see that clearly there's something here. Then during the lockdown, no one sent any, no one participated in data collection. So this is, this is very good information you can use. So you can use different mappings to, to get better insights on your data. And then uh, cluster maps. Like I said, the cluster maps, uh, for them, they, they are more of the data points. So this was some point, this was, this was, this is showing for some point before, before the lockdown when farmers were submitting. So you can see that the Eastern region is performing better than the rest of the regions. So with cluster, a cluster map is interactive. So you can zoom in to see the distribution of the collection. 
So we shall go to the next part. Then you can also use foliar maps. So foliar maps are also interactive. You can be able to see different things like the roads. If you zoom in, for, you can see the roads, you can see the houses, which is not the case for, which is not the case for chloropath maps. For example, this map here. When you see this map here, you can't, you, you can't know like what, or even if you see this map here, there's nothing like the river or a road. You can't know whether the farm are collected at the road. You can't zoom in to get that kind of information. But with the foliar maps, you're able to see that farmers were able to collect data, mostly near the roads, mainly because I think transport, of course. And then maybe some of the crops were collected more from near water bodies. So you can get all that information using the foliar maps. Yeah, so I'll go to the next one. So the next one is distance measure. So the importance of distance measure, it is needed to calculate other things like speed taken for a particular journey. Then it also helps us to make decisions based on the outcome of the distance. For example, the incentives for our case of, for our case whereby farmers were given a small incentive to, to, to do that for the crowdsourcing activities. So measuring distance from one point to another, you can use Euclidean distance, you can use the harvest sign, you can use Vicentis. So for Euclidean distance, it assumes a flat land. So you can only use it when, if you cannot use Euclidean to measure distance between two particular points on earth because earth is not flat. So this one can only be used when the land is flat. So you can use the Pythagoras theorem, S squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. And then we have the have assigned distance measure, which I'm going to be talking about. So for it, it's for a spherical ground, for example, the R. And then that comes in the Vicentis distance measure. So for Vicentis, it takes into account that the earth is not perfectly spherical and it calculates the ellipsoidal distance between two points. And it's also used for zero points. So you can see that here. So there's, I, there are very many other methods you can use, but I'm going to only be talking about the harvest sign. So for the harvest sign, it measures, it, the measure determines great circle distance between two points on a sphere, given the longitudes and latitudes. So for it, how the distance is calculated is that the total distance is calculated by you calculate the distance between consecutive points and then you sum up these distances. So I'm going to show you an example where a farmer of ours, one of our farmers was able to travel and then were able to get the distance using the harvest sign <clears throat> distance measure. So it um so the formula, the formula is quite complicated, but thanks to Python. You can just install Harvesting, import the library, and then you calculate the distance between the points. So you go from this to just this if you import it. And then it's also important to note that the answer given is in kilometers by default, but you can use um, you can you can choose what what unit you want to. You can choose a unit that you want to use. For example, here we used meters, so our answer was in meters. This was for our farmer from one point to another. So he just moved um, 5.6 meters from one point of data collection to another point of data collection. So the answer can also be in inches, it can be in feet, it can be in miles, depending on what you want. So on the next slide, you see that uh, I sampled one of the farmers on a specific day from the time he started to that other time. So, this what what just like I said for have a sign uh, for it it looks at it calculates the distance by calculating the distance from between consecutive points so from one point to another so in other words the the longitude and latitude points keep changing that's what you're seeing in the y and the z and the z and then so we calculate distance so from this point to this point so the new starting points be, the new starting point becomes the previous point. Does that make sense? So you keep adding up those distances. So when he goes to another point, the previous one becomes the starting point. So there's that distance measured. Then when he goes to another, the same, the previous point that he's from becomes, so that's how have a sign calculates its distance. Yeah, so I was able to get 
how he traveled uh, for some for, for on that day for from 432 to 445 using have a sign. And then this is just a representation how he traveled. Yeah, so there's another thing that, so with this, since you have the distance traveled and you have the time, you can measure the speed that the farmer takes to travel. So considering the number, you can get the speed considering the number of forms collected. So for, for these particular examples, he had collected 25 forms within that period of time. So this sort of helps us to manage our expectations in terms of how much data we can expect from a farmer in a specified period of time. So that's it. And then thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you so much, Gloria, for this wonderful presentation about GeoPandas. Uh, we have two questions in the chat. And uh, one is from Rodney Mogasha. And he's asking, a sampled farmer's data representative of the whole district? A sampled farmer's data representative of the whole district? That's his question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I get the question, but are you asking if, I, I don't know, I, may, I don't know, maybe you can ask. Rodney Mugasha. Okay, he also has another question that you could probably okay. answer as you okay. wait on him. Uh, how did you incentivize, uh, incentivize farmers to submit data? How did you incentivize them to submit data? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a, I think this will be better described by Mutembesa in his presentation, but our farmers, there's a, there's a way in which our farmers were being given um, money through mobile money for a specific number of forms that they submitted to us in a week. So for each week that a farmer submitted data, they were able to, they were given something through mobile money as an incentive to keep to keep sending that data and use it for 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 buying data, mobile data also. Yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, let me allow Rodney to ask his question. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, a uh, very insightful presentation. And I think it has a long way to help farmers in the whole country be able to manage their, their agriculture. Uh, my question is, um, it, it is based on um, the metrics you provided, uh, district with the highest number of uh, uh, production, those metrics you presented. My question is related to the information, the way you designed the system, Does it is it able to, when you ask a question like, the district with the most production of beans, for example, is it based on the whole district uh, production because you mentioned earlier on that you sampled out some farmers. So do you get the actual, do you get an accurate picture of a district with the highest production based on the metrics you provided? That's why I'm asking, is the data farmers you who are um, providing the data, do they represent the whole district? So that you get an, an accurate picture of production in the whole district. Therefore, you're able to measure across many districts. That was my question. Um, thank you very much for that question. So yeah, like I earlier mentioned, uh, the farmers were, these, these was, the, there were specific farmers that were selected to join us on this project and help us with crowdsourcing. So it does not in, in, entirely, it does not cover the entire district. It's based off the different farmers that were selected by the experts based on different things, how, how active the farmers are, the crop production, how, how much, how much um, beans or maize or cassava are they producing? Are they active farmers? So it is not it is not entirely the whole district. It is based off these farmers that were selected on certain criteria. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you so much.